Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Lewis Myers and welcome to this month's edition of Healthcare Today. We're going to be talking about a relatively new innovation in medicine and medical education and that is the use of simulators to teach medical students, nursing students, nurses and physicians. And with us today we have two guests who are on the front lines of bringing this technology uh, to, our, uh, to our workplace and to our university. Mr. Jacob Lind is, has joined us from Rutland, Vermont. He's with the company Tacit, Tacitly Operations, uh, which uh, Mr. Lind studied biomedical engineering at uh, Latorno University in Longview, Texas, and then returned to his native Vermont. And this, uh, insti uh, this company is involved with teaching nursing and nursing students how to quickly get up to speed uh, when they uh, are on the uh, units and the floors at the hospital. Dr. Daniel Ackle is here with us from the University of Vermont. Dr. Ackle is an emergency department physician and also the director of the simulation lab for emergency department residents and medical students at the University of Vermont. He attended the University of New England uh, Osteopathic Medical School where he got his medical degree and did his residency training in Rhode Island. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I should introduce this by saying when I was in medical school, which was a long time ago, uh, we had almost no simulators. It, almost everything was hands-on or big lecture halls. Um, it was on, uh, I don't remember any simulators, to be honest. Um, so this is a whole new world to me. And uh, I'm going to start with Mr. Lynn first, uh, down in Rutland. Um, tell us a little bit about your company and, and what your technology is, gonna, is doing. By the way, I should add that we're also going to have each of you has brought some video of, of how these work. Yeah, that I work for uh, Tacitly and that uh, we're a, a software company that develops uh, training for professionals using extended reality, uh, particularly for the, the medical field right now. And the idea is to, to make things more accessible by using uh, you know, digital learning tools. Can you give us an example of, of how this works? Sure. That uh, our, our uh, particular uh, thing we're working on is uh, called Code Cart XR, and that uh, code carts are used in Code Blue emergencies uh, when somebody's having a cardiac arrest or, or difficulty breathing. And they're a tool you really hope you don't have to use, but when you use it, you want to make sure you can make every second count. And so we've created a digital representation of a code cart that can be interacted with. Uh, because code carts are uh, sealed off with a lockout tag, certifying that that cart has all of its tools in the proper place, uh, n nothing's expired, and so uh, that if you break that lockout tag, before that cart can be used again, it has to be recertified, which uh, is an expensive and you know, difficult process. So that means accessibility to uh, familiarize yourself with the contents of a code cart is kind of difficult. You can't just take one aside and open it to look in it, and and uh, you know, arranging access to a physical uh, training cart you know, might be difficult for, for timing or, or uh, you know, finding somebody to, to give you access to it. So the idea is to uh, allow uh, a digital uh, recreation of it to make it extremely accessible and have zero cost of, of uh, familiarizing yourself with its contents. And as you've told me, <clears throat> we uh, have, of course, have a lot of visiting nurses coming in from other places to work in Vermont and vice versa. Some of the Vermont nurses go other places mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, are code carts different, each code cart? That, that's one of the difficulties that this helps to, to face is that code carts are not standardized. And so, and as you pointed out, that uh, visiting nurses, they might be seeing you know, a new hospital every three months or so. And that means that this critical tool that they're new to the hospital they're not familiar with the arrangement of the tools and medications inside. So that uh, arranging for easy access for that familiarity is super helpful. It gets that nurse up to speed and confident so that in the event uh, a code card does need to be opened and used, they're going to be familiar with it and uh, that much more effective with it. And I think I saw you demonstrating this earlier before we started. This is one of the virtual reality headsets? Yes, yes. So that you want to hold that up and just absolutely. show? Absolutely. So usually this uh, works independently of its own, but we currently have it wired to be able to record uh, the, the demonstration from it. And the idea is to uh, provide uh, a visual representation of the code cart that you can interact with in 3D space 
uh, while also being able to stay present in the room you're in and that uh, we're very proud that we make use of a hand tracking uh, on this so that there's no uh, need to learn controls or having other devices you have to work with. If you know how to use your hands, you can interact with the, the code card. Is there any audio? Yes, yes. So that, you know, that for our demo, there's not at the moment particularly, you know, much beyond ambient sounds of, uh, you know, boxes and drawers opening and, and the, the glass of the medicines clinking. But uh, we, we have hopes that, you know, in the future we could implement uh, some ambient sounds that are often present in codes that are, it's actually quite loud. There's monitors going off, there's people shouting for things, and you've got to be able to distill from that situation what's important and what to understand. So being able to practice with um, a demo and having uh, ambient noise that's an intentional distraction gets you prepared for the real thing. So you've started with something very specific, which is the code card. Do you see it expanding in, in terms of nursing education into other areas? Absolutely. The, the sky is sort of the limit that uh, we, we started with code cards because we saw such a need for it, as, as well as the fact that it's a, a high-risk, low-occurrence uh, event. Um, but there's all sorts of similar things that have that sort of accessibility difficulty uh, that we, we think of being able to open a lot of the other sealed medical kits that are, are sterile and such, that uh, there's often a particular order of operations with opening those and preparing them, laying them out for procedures. So if we could offer that same accessibility uh, to practice with those, that gives uh, nurses the ability to say, okay, I know I'm gonna be assisting in one of these procedures you know, tomorrow or later this week. I wanna give myself a quick refresher, grab a headset, and under a minute, you're being able to you know, go through those tools, open those those kits, and understand what your role is going to be later on. And then five minutes later, you can put the headset away and go about your day rather than having to worry about, you know, can I get down to the simulation department? Is somebody available to show me this particular thing? And then you're having to coordinate multiple people. Just we want to make it as accessible as possible and freeing up those, are, those uh, nurse trainers that are uh, responsible for training, giving them the opportunity to focus on other things rather than, you know, sort of these, uh, uh, what could be done individually with the headsets. Well, it sounds like it's a uh, very, very useful way to proceed as an adjunct to all the other ways that their people are learning. And we really appreciate you being here, and I know we're going to get a chance to see some of the video for that. So if you'll stay with us here, um, I'm going to also talk with Dr. Daniel Ackle, who I've already introduced. Uh, Director of Simulation for the uh, Merchants Department of Residence, University of Vermont, and also, broadly speaking, also for the medical students as well. Correct. The um, and I understand University of Vermont has been somewhat at the forefront for for simulator simulator training. Yes, um, the C Larner College of Medicine really prides itself on being at the forefront of medical education, and part of that mission is um, a concept of active learning. Uh, that when you are learning to be a physician, it, only so much can be learned in a lecture hall or from a textbook. So we want our students to get as much hands-on experience in these simulated uh, scenarios as possible. Um, again, similar to what Jacob is focusing on, we like to focus on these so-called high-acuity, low-occurrence scenarios um, and all of the potential medical procedures uh, that go along with that. Um, so the college has really invested um, in that, that concept of cutting edge technology and we're very fortunate um, to have the clinical simulation laboratory um, at our disposal. Um, it's a state of the art center over 9,000 square feet and when you walk in you'd think you were in a hospital room or in an emergency department. Um, and along with just the space, the, the mannequins, the technology is constantly evolving um, and through grants and uh, funding through the school, we've been fortunate enough to, to stay at the forefront of that with our extremely high fidelity mannequins. Yeah, let's talk about the mannequins. I know many pe viewers may have taken CPR classes or even uh, ALS classes, advanced life support, where you got to know Rasasa Annie, which is a large plastic uh, facsimile of a person. Um, but you've gone way beyond that in these mannequins. What can this mannequin do? Correct. Uh, yeah, so the, the 3G mannequin we use, um, can really do almost anything. Um, you, you can change the size of its pupils, you can change its breath sounds, you can swell the tongue uh, to simulate an anaphylaxis or allergic reaction scenario, for example. Um, 
Some of them you can cut into the chest wall to simulate a chest tube. You can um, perform a cricothyrotomy into the neck. So, it, and the co the technology is just constantly evolving. So, can I ask what one of these costs? Uh, um, to be honest, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but they're uh, in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. Um, let me ask, uh, in terms of medical school, and I know that you work more perhaps with the residents, uh, but one of the, uh, uh, I know people know that first year medical students go through gross anatomy, mm -hmm. which is sort of a rite of passage where you crowd around uh, someone who's, who has do donated their body to science after their death and, and students dissect and, and learn in that way. There have been some concerns in, in recent years, particularly since there's a lot of exposure to formaldehyde, so these young people are getting contact and uh, breathing in formaldehyde for several months, and also the fact that it may, just is not as realistic as living tissue. Is there a role for simulating the gross anatomy s so that people are not spending so much time in that particular setting? Yes, um, there are several companies in uh, the medical device industry that are really committed to creating that um, lifelike tactile feedback through their products. The, the Recess Annie that you had mentioned um, is really not, has not been around that long, but the evolution in the quality of the latex and in terms of procedures like cutting and inserting needles um, has evolved. Just the three-dimensional imaging of the body that that can now be done <clears throat> through computer simulation is, is tremendous. Correct, yes. Their, um, their anatomy course at the College of Medicine does still utilize the cadaver base, um, but you're right in terms of uh, the tissue itself, it's, it's not quite the same. By the time students reach third year medical school and they go into their surgery rotations, it's well known that many much of that rotation involves holding tr retractors, which basically you're just, it's an important job, but you're basically just holding the tissue open so that the surgeon can see what they need to see and do what they need to do. But it's, it's not particularly ennobling or, or even educational. Is there a role for simulators to help teach third year medical students, for example, in, who are doing their surgical rotations? Yes, the, the clinical simulation lab at UVM, the Lardner College of Medicine, um, again, they're completely committed to cutting-edge technology. They have uh, simulation trainers for the surgeons or surgeons in training, medical students to practice um, laparoscopic skills, um, as well as in our ultrasound curriculum, uh, performing ultrasound on uh, on task trainers. We also have a fairly uh, robust community of uh, simulated patients who are. Um, will fulfill the role of actor or standardized patient and uh, that's been a resource we've used quite a bit in terms of learning physical exam skills, interviewing. Of course that's been around for, for many decades. One thing that, that has developed over the last 20 years is the robotic surgeries yes. um, where a surgeon uh, who are trained in this will actually not have their hands on the patient. They'll be sitting across the room looking into a, a screen and almost like a video game using uh, remote uh, sticks to, uh, to do the surgery, send a signal to the uh, scalpels that are actually doing the cutting. Tell us a little bit about that and how the work you do interacts with that. Yes, yeah, so I don't, can't speak directly to those devices, but um, my understanding is, it, again, there's a training, um, module or training simulator, similar to what pilots go through and uh, similar to what we're doing with our residents in terms of the higher risk procedures, is we have a, a safe simulation space where it's okay to you know, learn and make mistakes in a safe environment. Yeah. Um, and then after you're credentialed and have gone through uh, a certain number of scans or practice procedures, but also going through a checklist by a verified educator, then you would be credentialed to perform those tasks on, on live patients. You mentioned uh, pilots, of course, race car drivers, and, and a number of other professions now using these high-tech simulators, which are almost, almost as realistic as being in the cockpit of a plane or a Formula One car. Um, have you learned, has, our, has the medical profession learned from these technologies? Are we borrowing from these technologies? I think so. I, I think um, 
yeah, even seeing what Jacob <laughs> yeah, is doing. And the virtual reality. Virtual reality. Fantastic. There's uh, a lot of synergy there across industries, across businesses and in healthcare. Uh, it's great to see is um, sort of leading and helping lead the way. Do you, s let's talk about cost because, you know, we're in a cost efficiency environment now. Um, it sounds like it's, from Jacob's perspective, it saves time and money by not having to break open code carts and, and have extensive human training. What about in wh what you're seeing? Is it, I, yeah. I know up front the costs are, are significant as you've mentioned, but yes. we, do we recoup those? We envision uh, simulation really as a cost saving measure, especially as it pertains to these high acuity, um, low occurrence procedures, for example. One of the th one of the scenarios we train um, and we train across our network sites in New York and Vermont, and we've established a program to bring the simulation to these community hospitals. Um, one of the scenarios is an emergency department delivery. Um, yeah. And in a scenario like that, if if everyone in the emergency room in the middle of the night has never delivered a baby or been in that scenario, uh, it could be very you know high stakes. So we feel bringing this training. Um, certainly will lead to better patient outcomes and, you know, in theory would help save money from, you know, a, a risk management standpoint. Um, aside from, uh, finally, I want to ask about artificial intelligence. We had two University of Vermont medical students who were about to graduate on the show last May and I asked them this as well. Um, artificial intelligence, I assume, is going to interact in some way with what you're doing, but they also, the flip side of that question is the human touch. Uh, do we risk by going to predominance if we uh, simulating that we lose that human contact and mentorship that is so important? Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, the artificial intelligence, again, it's extremely uh, impressive to see where things are heading. But uh, like you had mentioned, with our, with our standardized patients and our communication skills as providers and caregivers, those are skills that can't be, can't be done by artificial intelligence. So we still really value uh, the oldest training methods they've been doing at the College of Medicine for over 40, 50 years, even longer. Um, so we like to blend a hybrid together and, and create a robust curriculum uh, that encompasses both cutting edge technology, but also core fundamental communication yeah. skills. Yeah, I, J Jacob's nodding, so I think he agrees. Yeah, that uh, the way we like to view it is that you know, these new tools that they free up the people who are doing those, you know, in-person training, that they can have their attention focused more on that. And then uh, we see that these tools are sort of uh, preparation to be able to interact with that. So if you can free the, the trainer up so that they can focus on their thing, then you have multiple people having access to, uh, you know, a, a VR trainer or, or a, an AI simulated patient interaction that uh, it gives them sort of a primer for when it goes to the actual interaction. So in no way does that need to be, you know, ever replaced. It's just give people uh, a jump start on being able to interact. Well, this is a brave new world. We've just begun to introduce it. Uh, I really want to thank our guests. I know they brought some videos that the, our audience will be seeing about each of the technologies that they're working with. Jacob is now going to show us, uh, using his virtual reality, what the program would look like for the nurses uh, and nursing students who are uh, learning how to use the cr crash cart. Yeah, so that uh, this is our, our main product that we're developing right now, and that uh, we have what we like to call a digital twin of a code cart here, and the intent is to make the cart have all the appearance of a hospital's actual cart as well as the location of all of the the medications and everything inside should be true to how they have theirs arranged because these are not standardized and it's different for each and so being able to go in and just pick things up and interact with them that we can also excuse me that uh, point to be able to get the names to scan through things because you know sometimes uh, it can be a little difficult to read small text in, in the, the digital environment. Uh, and then the, the intent is that if, if you know how to use your hands, you can interact with, with something in here. As, as well as a nice feature is that you don't have to worry about cleanup. If it falls on the floor, we can just automatically reset, which is important because uh, 
part of education is the more repetitions you can get, the better the information sticks. And so with a physical cart, you would have to reset everything, put everything back, verify that everything is indeed in the correct position, and then you can start another repetition. With this, it's as simple as just resetting the entire thing, everything's back in its place, and you're ready to start another set of training. I have to say, just being here watching you do this, I'm astounded at your dexterity. Now, some of this people, even younger people, might not have ever used virtual reality. That in itself will be a bit of a learning curve, won't it? Yeah, that uh, one of the things we pride ourselves in is that the hand tracking, uh, as well as the pass-through, uh, makes it so it's a lot more intuitive, that you're not completely put in a uh, foreign environment. You still see the room around you, you still see the people around you, and that you're not separated from the content by, you know, having to learn a control scheme. You've just got your hands and you can just interact as you like. That's fantastic. Now we were talking also offline that uh, as opposed to the several hundred thousand dollar uh, simulating uh, devices up at University of Vermont, this virtual reality may go for as little as a thousand dollars. Yeah, for, for the actual hardware, yes. Yeah. So that there, there's the, the cost of uh, the, the development of everything, but the, the physical hardware necessary to run this uh, is, is about in that range, which is... So you would have to go into the institution and film this initially, right? Because as you said, each crash cart may be different. So yes, so we, we envision an onboarding process where if a hospital was interested in you know, using this for training at their location, that uh, we would go and take reference pictures of everything, uh, make sure it's accurate, and then we'd create that digital twin and uh, get it back to them and make sure everything's in its place and then they've got a one-to-one -one representation of their cart with uh, easy access. Well, that's fantastic. Jacob, thank you so much for showing this. Now your company again is called Tacitly? Uh, Tacitly Incorporated. So, Tacitly yes. Incorporated out of Rutland, Vermont. So thank you so much. This is exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you as well.